First John, we have been in since after Easter. We have been taking this uh, idea, if you're going from chapter one all the way through, line by line, we've been opening up the Bible. So if you have your Bibles here, uh, wave them around like you just don't care. No, I'm just kidding. Keep a hold of them. Just break them open to First John chapter four. We're going to break into the word today, and we're going to be in verse number seven. Verse number seven. If you are physically able... Uh, the words are going to be up here on the screen as we read through them. But if you're physically able, would you stand for the honoring of the reading of God's Word? We've been doing this a few different ways throughout this particular section because we have God's Word right in front of us so that we're all on the same page. There's some weeks where I ask you to help me read it out. Uh, but this week, I just kind of want to read it. But I want you to stand just to say, God, you've given us your Word. It's not just written. I want this Word to be written on my heart when I leave. So let it not just be standing up on the presentation on the screen. Let it not stay on the, the printed words of the Bible. Let it actually resonate in our soul so that we can walk out and be the living print of what God wants to do in our city. Amen? Come on, church. Let's get into this. I'm going to read it, and I want you to just kind of receive it as we go through there. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God, and not only born of God, but knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 9, in this the love of God has made manifest among us, that God sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved, but God loved us and sent his son as a propitiation for our sin. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, this doesn't come out of nowhere, the reality is God abides in him, if you're able to say that. And he, that person, abides in God. Verse 16, so that we have come to know, but not just to know, and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love, love abides in God. Verse 17, by this love is perfected. That's the second time he said that. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. I love that statement. As he is, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love, come on, somebody say it, cast out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love first because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen definitely cannot love the God who he has not Scene. Verse 21, he wraps it up with a summarizing statement. And this is the commandment that we have from him. This is, for, this is from God. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining me. You guys can have a seat. Are you familiar with word searches? You know, the, uh, uh, a mixture of a whole bunch of letters thrown together in like somewhat of a square and then all of a sudden you're just jumbled at a first glance with a whole lot of mixture of just letters and words and you have to do the work to actually diligently go in and try to find the words, circle them and identify them. I feel like 7 through 21, this section that, that John gives us is much like a word search. There's a lot of great content in there. But if you actually know what you're searching for, there's actually three main points that he breaks down and elaborates on. So instead of 7 through 21 being a whole lot that John says, it's actually three main things that John says that he actually just um, moves and expounds upon as he goes. So when you read this, I want to break this down for you. So when we see this section, you're going to know a little bit about where we're going three main ideas, and the breakdown is this. It, John gives us a definition of his love. The second one is that God's love for us gets poured into our hearts so that we can give it to others. And the third idea happens three times in verses 13, 15, and 16, which is the abiding idea, that you would just remain in God's presence. Have you ever wondered what you're calling, your purpose, your identity, your destiny? Anybody ever wondered that? your calling, your purpose. Are you human? Raise your hand. Love participation. 
I didn't get you with the first question, so maybe I'll get you with this one. If you ever wondered about your identity and your purpose, there it is, to sit, abide, remain in God's presence. That's what you were made for. That's what you were created for. That is your identity. And so whenever we see this, John is trying to write in this little section and in this entire book and in the entire Bible that your identity and your destiny and your purpose, why you were created to come here was to do just what Jesus did. As he is, also are you in this world to abide, remain, have your soul deeply connected to the heart of God so that whatever you do, come on somebody, you would do so for the glory of God. But he has to redefine it. Here it is, a definition of love. I don't know if you noticed this, but our society's definition of love is a little bit skewed. I mean, we, we leave here at church today, and what's the, what's the first conversation? Are we going to go out to lunch? Where do you want to go? I would love some Mexican. You know what I mean? Like, I love that shirt you're wearing. Man, I, I love Sharpies. I love this type of pen. I love number two pencils. I don't even know why they don't make number ones, but I love number two. Like, we say that a lot, really, about everything. So then all of a sudden, the word that's supposed to be rich and deep and really just an impact of experience to realize God's love is now used for finite things that are totally temporary, and it just dilutes the very essence of what God's trying to say. And so John here says, I need to redefine love for you. So let me just break it down for you. He says these particular things inside the book of 1 John. If you're writing notes, you can write this down. Love is selfless. Love puts other people before you. Love thinks about others before it thinks about yourself. Now, I know what you're thinking. How do you value someone else? How do you love on someone else? How do you serve someone else? Because that would be a selfless type of love. And a lot of times, you know, you just kind of go around with this um, mentality and this attitude of, well, everyone's really kind of better than me, so it's really not, not hard. You got great clothes. I can value you. You're smarter than I am. You're, you're talented. And as you build somebody else up, it just breaks you down. That's not the love that he's talking about. The love that God's talking about, that we would be a selfless type of love, would be a confidence knowing who we are, receiving God's love, and but not making ourselves the center of attention. Like you walk into a room and realize in your mind, I'm a big deal. God loves me, but it's not about me. Because I'm secure and confident in who I am. I want to make it about you. My selfless love actually lifts you up. You're down. Let me help you. You don't have hope. Let me give you some hope. You don't feel like you have love. Let me give you some love. You're not encouraged. Let me encourage you because I personally am satisfied. My tank is overflowing. You know what it's like to be refreshed? Like just to be refreshed in general. Like you're not weary. You're not tired. You're filled with love. You're filled with hope. What do you do? You just want to give that out. You're nice, you're kind, you're loving, you're, you're compassionate, you're gentle, you give mercy without it being required of you. That's a selfless type of love. It's not a degrading of a self-image, it's a selfless type of love who puts other people's interest above their own. It's a sacrificial love. And sometimes what that means is you have to act first. Is you have to step out when somebody else doesn't apologize and you know they need to, you apologize first. You go up to them, you know that you're, there's an issue. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed this in a relationship? There's an issue between me and this other person. It's probably their fault, but what you do is love takes the initiative, love acts first, love leads the way. So you go to them and you say, how can we resolve this conflict? Come on, somebody, you catching this? That's what love does. It doesn't just wait for them to come back and just, you know, I guess if they want to talk with me, they know where to find me. <laughs> Love leads. You push down the walls and you go to them. Yes, they've hurt you, but why don't you go make it right? That's what love does. It makes yourself vulnerable. Love hurts. Why? It's because it cost us greatly. It cost us in a relationship. And a lot of people will say, I don't want to love because of the, the deep wound that I have because I've exposed my heart. That's the more reason why we need to access people in love so that we can actually have that thing healed. That's exactly what God did. If he would have waited and not sacrificed, if he would have waited and had a selfish love, if he would have waited and have his love not be faithful, if he wouldn't have come down and actually served us, we would have no example 
We would have no visual. We would have no idea what it would look like, but we do know what it looks like. We do know what a sacrificial love that costs us greatly, but rewards the other person. We do know what that looks like because Jesus, come on somebody, gave that to us. So because we have received that, we can now give it. And this is the idea that God wants to say. Point number two of this, this entire section is that God's love for us is poured out into the lives of others. I want to read this particular section, um, but just to think I'm reading through Scripture would be um, a disjustice of this. This is actually all sections, verse 21, 9, 8, 7. They're just periodically thrown out there. It's, it's a mixture. But what I want to do is actually put them in order of topics. So all these scriptures from 1 John chapter 4, 7 through uh, 21, I'm going to take out, I'm going to put in order so that you can read what he's talking about under the umbrella that God loves you first, therefore love one another. You following me? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Verse 21, this is the command that we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Whoever loves God must love his brother. Verse 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I want you to look at verse 11 just for a second. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. John Stott, a great theologian, passed away a handful of years ago, said something that I've always remembered. He says, some of the deepest theological truths are found in presuppositions. Sometimes we read this and we say, well, these, there's some great truths, and I can pick them out. Uh, beloved, that's a, that's a big doctrine. Uh, God, that's huge. That's theology. Loved, you can talk about agape love. It's not an affectionate, just a, uh, an emotional love. That's, that's huge. And all these doctrines, you can just pinpoint. But he says some of the deepest theological truths are actually found in presuppositions. So when you look at that, you have to pause and say, verse number 11, what's it say? If. <laughs> like, it's pending on this one word, If. You have no ability to love one another if God hasn't first loved you. Come on, somebody, you catching this? Like, you don't even know what to do to serve your spouse. You don't even know what to do, what it looks like to serve your children. You don't even know what it looks like in your coworkers to serve and love and sacrificially show up in someone's life after they've hurt you if God hasn't demonstrated the ultimate love for you already by sending down his son when you didn't even deserve it and dying for you. So that he can say, now that's the type of love that I want you to first receive, abide, remain in, and then I want you to give it out. If that one word, (laughs) that one presupposition hangs on the discourse of the rest of the, the idea. If God has so loved you. I love that. So loved. He has so loved you. If that's true, then you ought to love one another. Verse 12, he goes on by saying, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, if, if we love one another, then God abides in us and his love is actually perfected. Beloved, let us love one another. Verse 7, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. In this, the love of God is made manifest among us, that God has sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. What's the proof? Can I just ask, uh, based off of verse 9, what's the proof that God actually sent his son, and that is not just an idea, but it's a reality? What's the proof? Is it the amount of churches we have in America or the world? Is it the preaching that we do? Is it the worship? Is it, is it the Bible? Is it prayer? I mean, what's the proof to the world that God actually exists? Verse 9 says it's the evidence of a love that comes down from heaven that's different from the world. Some of the issues that we're having in our world today are because of the absence of God's presence, because of the absence of love. What if we were to break down the convenient type of love that Hollywood gives us and actually love with the powerful manifestation and obvious experience of what God would have us to love when we start in our house, we start in the church, and we bring it out to the streets? What would that look like? What would happen to our world when we start giving away love to people that just 
don't deserve it. Verse 19, we love because God first loved us. He took the initiative. He led the way. He laid down his life so that we actually have something to go off of. Verse 20, but if anyone says, now this is the opposite spectrum. If anyone says, I love God but hates his brother, he's a liar. Now, what is he lying about? I just got to be frank with you. He might be lying about his Christianity. If we have an inability to love out here, it's not that we need to practice harder with the people in front of us. It's that we need to come to the reality of thinking, I'm probably lying to myself and thinking God's evident in here. And that's tough for us because we're in the South. I mean, there's, there's more churches than McDonald's right now. And so whenever you, you come across that, you have the conversation, hey, do you love Jesus? Absolutely. Do you go to church? I definitely do. Uh, when I want to, and, you know, when it's convenient or when there's hard times. But yeah, I definitely agree with that stuff. And good for you for you doing it as well. I mean, that's common just because there's nice people. There's just moral goodness around. Jesus didn't come to die and take our lives for nice people. He came so that he can absolutely wreck the idea that heaven would come down to earth, penetrate our lives, and actually show up on the city so that we can see a different world being lived out. So if we see this reality, the lie, the, 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 the truth that we really need to believe is, God, I want to know there is no part of hatred. There's no part of evil. There's no part of darkness in here because I want you to invade it because I'm fully surrendered to you. I want your light to show up. I want your love to show up because I can't do it on my own. I don't want to lie to myself anymore thinking that I'm just trying to practice my way into Christianity and actually just rest in your commandments so that the overflow of your goodness and your grace, then I can practice that. And it would be the overflow of my heart. If anyone, this is verse 8, anyone who does not love doesn't know God because God is love. Have you ever been encouraged by somebody? Like you just, you show up in their presence and they're just enthusiastic and they're charismatic and they're joyful. And, and you seek some of those people out whenever you're having a hard time. Have you ever done that? Like, I know you're a little bit joyful. Today, I'm not. So you attach yourself to them. So when you leave, what are you hoping? Your behavior would change. This is, this is what they're saying. If anyone who does not love God, you don't know him. Because if you just spend a little bit of time with him, you recognize he's not this, um, he's not this dictator who's just coming down and trying to reprimand and consequence you. It's God's kindness that leads you to change. Come on, somebody. It's his love. It's his steadfastness. It's not his harshness. He's a good father. But maybe we've distorted that image a little bit and we need to re reintroduce the God of the Bible so that we can be reintroduced to the God of this world. He can come back and have love be present and our world will change tomorrow better than it was yesterday. Finishing in verse 20, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen breaks down to the third point, which is just remaining, abiding. This is the third main idea in this word search full of section. He says, listen, we need, a, we need a new definition of love. We need to redefine that. But can I just say, it's not just a redefinition of the love. It's not just a, a, a new principle. It's not just something you can write down. Hey, I've never heard that wording. It's not just semantics because it's word order. Can I just tell you, can I go on record and just make sure we're all on the same page here? That God wants a deeper experience of his love for you that goes way beyond your definition of his love. He wants you to experience his love, not just define it. He wants you to get wrecked by it, not just check it off the box and say, yes, I think I know something about it. And so whenever we're looking at this, this is the section that he redefines. It is not just in words, but it's in actions. He wants to tuck it down deep in our soul. Let us catch this. By this, we know, this is verse 13. By this, we know that we abide in him, that we abide in God, and then also God abides in us. Because he has given us his spirit. He has given us his Holy Spirit. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Because you can't say with your mouth and believe in your heart, come on somebody, that Jesus is God without the Spirit of God doing some work inside. 
You can't love somebody when they don't deserve it. You can't give to somebody when they don't deserve it unless God's doing a work inside here. You can't forgive somebody until God does some work in here. You can't give mercy whenever they need justice unless God is doing something in here. Verse 16, and so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. We have come, two things, to know and to believe the love that God has for us. John puts two words in there, to know and to believe. Anybody know anything about Australia? Show of hands. Know a little bit about? <laughs> I don't know if this participation is down today or geographically you're not really aware of. Australia is uh, south. You know, it's... <laughs> Type it on the internet, it's uh, www. I'm just kidding. Australia, you guys somewhat familiar? Okay, Who, who's actually been to Australia? A couple of people, what's up? You guys from there right now? Oh, come, you guys wanna come up and speak? We love your accent. <laughs> so fantastic. See, I was gonna go with like an experience of like Florida, but I chose Australia, probably just for you guys. This is amazing. Let's, let's chat afterwards. Um, I love talking with people with accents because I, I sometimes I, I try to pick them up. Have you ever done that? They're like, yeah, mate, it's an absolutely lovely time we had here. And then, and then whenever, whenever they leave, they're like, I don't know what I was doing, but I just, it just got in your mind. Do you ever do that? Anyway, back to the message. Um, it's talking about Australia. There's a difference between knowing about Australia and actually going there to experience it firsthand. This is the knowing that God's talking about. I don't want you just to read it in a book. I don't want you just to take somebody else's word for it. I don't want you just to see it from a distance from somebody else that has actually encountered God's love. I want you to buy the plane ticket, come on somebody, to take off work, to go down 24 some odd hours in a plane ride into a totally different continent of a time zone so that you can experience Australia, so that you can go there. Then you can travel back back to America, back in your state, back in your world and say, I know about that place. Then, this is totally up to you, then you can start to believe in that place. And if, if you have it inside of your soul, inside of your mind, the atmosphere, the people, the accents, the, the, the geographical change and the shift that you actually experience in Australia, and you come back, then you start to believe that Australia is like your hometown. This is where you're from. So then you start to live out the, the reality of Australia right here. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. We've experienced the taste of heaven so that we can draw heaven back down to earth. We want to experience God's love because the people don't deserve it. I didn't deserve it, but I received it. I'm going to give out something that I don't deserve. I have an accent. I have a changed way of living. I have a changed mindset. There is repentance. There's literally a change of mind because of where I've been. And I'm going to show up and let you know I'm not actually from around here. Or how does it go? I'm not actually from around you. It's something like that, yeah? Giddy up. I'm, I'm seriously done with the accents from now on. My wife is like, yes, please be done. I want to tell you a story, because uh, this is my hope right from the very beginning, us praying into our time today. And I felt like this was such rich content inside of chapter four that I didn't want you guys just to go away with some good pencil sketchings on three main points of uh, what love is, or maybe after today you could redefine love in a sense that uh, maybe First John would actually clue you in to something that you haven't heard before. I really wanted an idea that I was praying into that God would give me some sort of a story or an experience so that we could be on the same page of walking out here and actually thinking, okay, how do we do this on a day-to-day -day level? So let me give you a principle, and then I want to tell you a story. Here's the principle. Love is most present in the midst of contrast. Love is most present in the midst of differences. Love is most present in the midst of diversity. If everyone was the same, it'd be easy to love. Come on, have you ever thought that? If your spouse was a little bit more like me, this thing would be easier. Come on, somebody. Don't raise your hand. It's not a good time. If this person had my background, they would understand where I'm coming from. If you walked in my shoes, you would realize why I made that statement. 
In the midst of diversity, in the midst of contrast, love is the most present, but it's also a choice. In comes Jack and Maria. High school people, two very unlikely candidates to ever get together. Jack was from a small town. He was poor, didn't really have much. Uh, Maria was a well-to-do, influenced, very classy person uh, that grew up a little bit wealthy with influence, and she was rich. Two people went to the same school. And of course, Jack took note, come on somebody, of Maria. I know who she is, but Maria had no liking to Jack or even his existence until one day they were in class together, and she actually made Jack the blunt end of a joke disrespected him, used him at the end of a joke or something that just dishonored him. The whole class erupted, they pointed at him, they laughed, they jeered on, and the day went. The next day, Jack privately came up to the locker of Maria and actually said, I want to give you this. And a little bit surprised, she said, what's this? He said, it's a silver dollar. And she goes, why, why would you do that? And he said, I want to give you this because my parents always taught me to give to people when they don't deserve it. You you are a wealthy individual and you don't need my money. And this is a big sacrifice to me, sacrificial love. I don't really have a lot, but what I do have, I want to give to you as a sign of me forgiving you. Now you can imagine the entire year, Maria actually took note of Jack and his demeanor and countenance and character throughout the year. Until one day, their senior year, to everyone else's dismay, they asked Maria not to go to prom with Jack, but everyone set it up for them to go together. She agreed. Come to find out, they had a fantastic time. And Maria learned a little bit more about who Jack really was, and Jack actually gave her the time of day to discuss and talk, and they fell in love. Over the summertime, they fell even more in love, but of course they graduated and then they went to two very different colleges. Well, they didn't let distance and geography separate their hearts together. They wrote letters almost every single day and they, they got together when they could, even on weekends. The only weekends that were open, they would, they, Jack would take a day's journey one way, Maria would take a day's journey the other way to meet in the middle, only to hang out for only a few hours knowing that that's all they had so that they had to turn around another day's journey to go back to either school or work. They did this until they graduated. And when they graduated, you guessed it, they got back together and they got married. It was a beautiful, amazing wedding, great relationship until one day Maria got a little bit sick and this common cold wasn't really getting kicked. She went to the doctor and they found out that she had a brain disorder. And the brain disorder was both affecting her behavior and also her memory and would deteriorate from here on out. So Every single day they would wake up not knowing what would happen, not knowing what that day would bring them, not knowing what kind of behavior would actually be in their marriage. Some days, Maria would actually wake up freaked out because there's someone in her bed, because she didn't recognize him as her husband. So Jack would take hours through letters and pictures and stories reminiscing about all that they have done and who they are together and about their relationship to try to convince her that they actually were together and they've been married for however many years. Through tears, at some point in time throughout that day, they would actually come together and she would be comforted and trusting that Jack was her husband. They would even go to date nights sometimes in the evenings and they would just go out very romantic and all things cordial until something snapped inside of her mind. She would stand up, make a really big scene, start yelling at him and just storm out when he never even did anything. This behavior and memory loss happened for years and years, unfortunately. In 11 and a half years of marriage, Maria passed away. And at their funeral, Maria's parents said, we don't want flowers, we don't want cards. We would just like you, if you're gonna be in attendance, just to financially give towards this medical center so that we could try to find a cure for this for somebody else. So of course the funeral was packed, it was amazing. But afterwards, a few weeks after that, the medical center actually came back to the parents and said, hey, listen, we want to thank you for such a big donation. I think this is really going to allow for some breakthroughs in what we're doing with our research. And the parents were a little bit 
surprised because the amount that they were talking about, they didn't give. So of course they got on the phone with some of their other wealthy, influential uh, friends that loved Maria. And they said, listen, did, did you give this? It was probably you, wasn't it? You loved Maria and you guys come from a background of pretty, being pretty well off. And all of their friends said, said it wasn't them. For weeks, they tried to find out who it was until somehow it ruffled through that it was Jack. It was Maria's husband. So their parents went back to Jack's house and they said, how did you have the means? Why, why, did, you, why did you do this? And he said, I made a decision a long time ago, way before I knew about her brain disorder that in spite of her disrespecting me or dishonoring me, I'm gonna invest in her when she doesn't deserve it. And every time she did, every time he felt alone, every time he wanted to quit, every time it would be easier for a divorce, every time he'd just walk away, he said, I'm gonna make a dollar contribution like I did in high school on the very first day they met. I'm gonna continue doing that for 11 and a half years sacrificial, selfless, faithful love that actually serves. So the parents were obviously very moved and in awe. They started walking out of Jack's house and through tears, <laughs> the husband looked at the wife and said, how much did he give? And she stopped and she turned and said, over $313,000. That's over 70 offenses every single day. I don't know what it would be like for us to be in the midst of adversity, to be in the midst of differences, but whatever your decision you have to make, we have an opportunity to love other people who are different than us. And that's exactly what God's calling us to do. He doesn't wanna just attach ourselves with people that we're actually familiar with or that we think alike, the people that have a same background as us or the same relationship or same personality. It's in the midst of diversity. It's in the midst of contrast. It's in the midst of differences between our relationships that we have an opportunity to love one another sacrificially, to put other people's interest above our own. This is the very essence of what Jesus did in Philippians 2. And there's practical, it's not just a principle, it's not just a story. This is a practical layout. If you can bring up Philippians 2, just let me read two or three verses with you because this is the essence of where Jack and Maria's story comes from. 11 and a half years, he lived out what Jesus was talking about. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or do nothing out of conceit, but instead count other people more significant than yourself. Let each of you look on the interest of others not just on yourself. And then he says this in verse five, have this in mind, have what in mind? Doing nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Have that in mind. Put other people's interest above your own. Have that in your mind. Why? Why does he say put that in your mind? Put that in your soul. If you can tuck that down deep inside of you, then you actually start to know the love of God. You start to believe the love of God. And then you have an opportunity to live it out because what you believe in, you will at some point in time live out? What would it look like for our city when you're faced with diversity and contrast for you to step in with a love that other people only know comes from heaven? I'll tell you what would happen. Our city would be changed. And I want to be marked as that city, as a family that comes together, that starts it in our home, that starts it in our church, so it can go out and literally fill the city, in Jesus' name.